This is a walkthrough for the uh, GIS Year 12 AS Physics Mock Paper 1. Okay, so question one. A wave has a frequency of 5 gigahertz. Um, so it's not a bad idea as you're doing these just to jot down uh, key facts as we go. So I'm going to say frequency is 5. Um, and this is a gigahertz, so that's 5 times 10 to the 9 hertz. It's always useful just to take out any uh, prefixes. What is the period of the wave? Um, so we know that uh, frequency is 1 divided by time period, so time period is 1 over the frequency. So we're looking for 1 divided by 5 times 10 to the 9. Uh, and when you punch that into your calculator, you will get... Uh, 2 times 10 to the negative 10 seconds. Um, so now what we need to do is uh, convert that into an SI unit. Um, so uh, nanoseconds, uh, a nano is times 10 to the negative 9. Um, this is smaller than that, um, so I can also say this is equal to 200 times 10 to the negative 12 seconds. 10 to the negative 12 is a pico. That's a picosecond. Question 2. Which is not an SI base unit? Um, this is one you should just know, that is the Coulomb. You should definitely know that kelvins, kilograms and seconds are all SI base units. Coulombs are a quantity of electrons um, and we derive it from the definition of amps and second. A Coulomb is uh, one amp second. Uh, and an amp obviously is defined uh, by the uh, amount of current required to make a force of one newton between two one meter long wires. Uh, yeah, one meter, one meter apart? One meter apart doesn't sound right, um, but it's defined by the force between two wires. Anyway. Question three. Two forces, each of 10 newtons, act at point P as shown. The angle between the directions of the forces is 120 degrees. What is the magnitude of the resultant force? So just doing a quick little sketch, um, we're going to want to top and tail these vectors. So there's our 10 newtons, and then we're going to do our 10 newtons after that. Um, and this will be my resultant force here. Um, so uh, we're measuring, uh, actually we only asked for the magnitude, so that's fine. Uh, looking at the angle between them, I can say that this angle is 120 degrees. Okay, so in order to find uh, the uh, resultant force. There's a couple of different ways that we can um, uh, do this. Let's just uh, just think about the geometry here. Um, yeah, probably easiest if we do this. Let's call that 120 degrees as well because of those are z angles. Um, that means that this angle will be 60 degrees between the two. Um, so now I think we're going to be using the co the cosine rule here. Um, so the cosine rule, if you remember from your uh, IGCSE maths, um, that tells us that r squared will be equal to 10 squared plus 10 squared minus 2 times 10 times 10 times cos of 60 degrees. So let's try bashing that into a calculator um, and see what we get. Uh, so 10 squared plus 10 squared, uh, that's going to be 200. Uh, take away uh, sorry, uh, take away uh, 2 times 10 times 10, so that will be uh, 
200 as well. Is that right? 100 times 2, that looks about right. Uh, yes, that is right. Uh, so 200 minus 200 lots of cos of 60. So 200 cos 60, uh, that will come out as 100. So we should get r squared is equal to 200 minus 100. Uh, r squared, therefore, is 100. So R is equal to 10 newtons, which is correct. Let's check the math scheme. Uh, maybe it's a sign of how long it's been since I did maths. I was a little bit surprised by that, but that is the right answer. Question four. Digital balance is used to weigh ingredients in a laboratory. When the weight is applied to digital balance, the electronic circuit generates a current, which is then converted into digital readout on the display. Um, OK, so electric circuit is a current of 2 a 0 0.0 milliamps when a weight of 30 newtons is applied and a current of 5.0 milliamps when a weight of 5 newtons is applied. Which calibration curve could represent this circuit? Oh, okay, that's quite an interesting one. Um, so looking at something like this, let's just see if we can sketch it ourselves. Um, we've got two data points here. Um, one is at... Uh, 30 newtons, so the weight looks across here. Yeah. So I've got uh, so I've got five newtons and I've got 30 newtons. Um, at the 30 newtons, I have a 2.0, so that's going to be somewhere up there. Um, and I've got a current of 0 0.5 uh, here at the five newtons, something like that. Um, so. It's going to be between A or B, sorry, A or C. It's definitely not going to be uh, B or D. Um, now, so the only question is, is it likely to be a curve that goes up like this or like this? Um, I think it's going to be C. Um, but that would be wrong. It's actually A. So can I talk about why it's going to be A? Um, oh, OK. Yeah. OK. Then that does make sense. Um, so it at. Um, yeah. So we can do this by thinking about the gradient, I suppose. Yeah. 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 OK. I think about the gradient. So um, at this point here, uh, 5 newtons has given us uh, 0.5 milliamps. So at this point, I would have a gradient, which I'm going to use for M for gradient. Um, a gradient will be 0 0.1 uh, milliamps per newton. Over here, I have uh, 2 milliamps over 30. Um, so that will be 2 divided by 30. Uh, so at this point, my gradient is uh, 0.06 recurring, so 0 0.7 uh, milliamps per newton. So yeah, so I'd expect the gradient to be decreasing as it increases, as uh, weight increases. So this is going to be our calibration curve there. Oh, that's quite a good question. I like that. Question five. Uh, a student measures length L and time T of the oscillation of a simple pendulum. Uh, he then uses the equation shown to calculate the acceleration of free fall g. So you may have seen this equation before, or you may not actually. Actually, no, you won't see that until uh, A level, but don't worry. This, uh, sorry, until A2 level. Um, doesn't matter though, you can just use the equations. Um, so we have a quantity for L and a quantity for T, and we're asked for the percentage uncertainty uh, in his value there. Um, so what I'm doing is I am dividing uh, one quantity by another. So what you should remember is that when you uh, divide by something, you add the percentage uncertainties. Um, so let's add in the percentage uncertainty here. Uh, so 0 0.2 divided by 87.3 uh, times 100. That is 0 
to 9%. Um, and then 0 0.05 divided by 1.9 multiplied by 100. That is 2.63%. I'll keep it to three significant figures for both of these because the FI wants to two, so it should be fine. Um, <clears throat> so I'm dividing one by the other. Remember, when you divide two things, uh, you need to uh, multiply. So having got our percentage uncertainty in these two values, we now need to go back to the equation. And we're trying to calculate g with this. So first of all, we need to make g the subject of this. Um, so let's just do a bit of uh, manipulation to make g the subject. Uh, so we can say uh, t squared. No, let's get um, no, let's get uh, l over g by itself first. Um, so I can say uh, t over 2 pi is equal to square root of l over g. Square both sides. So that gives me t squared over 4 pi squared is equal to l over g. Uh, and then uh, multiply both sides by g. Uh, multiply both sides by 4 over pi divided by t squared, so that g is l lots of 4 pi squared over uh, t squared. Um, so what I'm doing is I am dividing uh, l by t squared. So what do I need to do to combine these uncertainties? Um, I need to, firstly, I'm, I'm squaring the t, um, so when you square a number, you double the percentage uncertainty. Uh, so the percentage uncertainty in t is going to be 2.63 times 2, that's uh, 5.26. Um, and then I'm going to add the percentage uncertainty in l, because I've squared, because that's the, uh, the rule for... Um, when you multiply or divide, you always add together the percentage uncertainties. So this is going to be uh, 2.63 times 2, which is 5.26. Uh, and then I'm going to add on the uncertainty in L, uh, which is uh, 0 0.229. And that comes to 5.26. 4.89%, uh, so it's going to be C, 5.5 if we round. Okay, question six. Uh, this one's about um, this one's about uh, double slit interference, uh, and I've already written the equation out here, so I'm just, and I've re rearranged it here for uh, wavelength. Um, so you can see I'm just uh, multiplying and dividing all these numbers. So nice and simple, I just need to uh, add together my percentage uncertainties. Uh, so, the percentage, so I need to now calculate the percentage uncertainties in each of them. Um, just because I've already got it on my calculator in front of me, I'll do uh, fringe separation first. That's 0 0.1 uh, divided by uh, 1.7 multiplied by 100. Um, so that comes to 5.89, sorry, 88%. Uh, this one, uh, the, the top one, separate the percentage uncertainty in A, that's 0 0.02 divided by 0 0.5 multiplied by 100, uh, so that is 4.00%. Um, and then this one is going to be an absolutely tiny percentage uh, uncertainty, uh, that's 0 0.002 divided by 2 multiplied by 100, so that's going to be uh, 1%. Uh, so add those all together, um, and you're going to get about 10%, obviously, depending on your rounding. Question 7. Uh, a stone is thrown vertically upwards from a point that is 12 metres above the sea. Uh, so let's... So it's basically going to draw... Some, it's going to do something like that. Uh, it then falls into the sea below after 3.4 seconds. There's an negligible. At what speed was the stone released when it was thrown? Oh, cool question. So, um, we know that the total time 
is 3.4 seconds. Uh, we know that uh, the distance um, that's going to be uh, oh, okay, right, yeah, okay. Um, so what can we say? We can say, uh, just by symmetry arguments, um, I know that the velocity at this point is equal to the velocity at that point. So let's do it this way then. Um, I'm going to kind of cheat and just do it the simple, the simple method. Um, I'm going to say that I know that at this point... Um, the velocity is the one I'm interested in. So I'm going to call that u. Um, and I'm going to be saying that u is the thing I'm trying to calculate. Because if I can find u, um, then I will know that, uh, you, that this u and this v are exactly the same. Because uh, when it goes past the same point, it will have the same velocity as when it was released. So we're going to do it that way. Um, so I now have uh, u as the thing I'm trying to find. S is 12 meters. Time taken is uh, 3.4 seconds. And I know that acceleration is 9.81 meters per second squared. Um, yep, yeah, okay, so I'm going to use then the equation S is equal to UT plus a half a t squared. That seems reasonable to me. Uh, so 12 is equal to u times 3.4 plus a half times 9.81 times uh, t, sorry, times uh, 3.4 squared. Uh, so that becomes 12 is equal to 3.4u plus, plus, bash this into a calculator, half times 9.81. My hands are cold, so my calculator is not listening to what I'm typing. Uh, 9.81 times 3.4 all squared. Uh, so this becomes uh, 56.7. Uh, I'm going to get a negative answer. Does that is that going to bother me? Let's just. Uh, okay, I don't think that's going to be a problem, but we'll just have to check in a minute. Uh, no, I don't think that's going to be a problem. Uh, so this is going to be uh, 12 take away 5 point, sorry, 56.7. Uh, so that becomes uh, minus 44.7. Uh, is equal to 3.4u, so u is equal to uh, so it's going to divide both sides by 3.4, uh, and that comes out as 13.1 meters per second, uh, which simplifies to c. Which is the correct answer. Hurrah. Okay, question eight. A device for spraying paint consists of a box with its axes horizontal and vertical. One of its vertical faces contains small holes. Paint is fed into the box under pressure via a vertical tube and exits through the holes as a fine streams moving horizontally. The paint is ejected at a speed of 2.5 meters per second through 400 holes, each with an area of 0.4 mill mill meters squared. The density of paint is 900 kilograms per meter cubed. What is the horizontal force required to hold the device stationary as it ejects paint? Okay, co again, cool question. Um, so, um, to do this, I'm going to use the fact that impulse is equal to change in momentum. 
um, and false times time taken is equal to impulse. Um, so what I want to know, um, therefore the force is equal to the rate of change of momentum. Um, so what I'm looking for for this is what is the change in uh, mv per second. That's the way I'm going to do it. Um, so what I can imagine is if I have a single hole here, it's going to have kind of a, a column of paint coming out of it with a cross-sectional area of uh, 0 0.4 millimeters squared. Um, and that's going to be in one second, I'm going to get a column that is uh, 2.5 meters long. So um, what I need to do is first calculate the volume of paint and then I'm going to get the mass of paint. Um, and then uh, multiply that by its velocity as well. Um, so I think I'm going to get an equation that looks something like this. Delta mv in one second will be uh, its density multiplied by cross-sectional area multiplied by its velocity squared. Um, because I'm going to need its velocity times area first to get the, the amount of paint, the volume of paint. Um, and then I'm going to have to multiply it by velocity again to get the velocity of that sort of column of paint coming out. Um, just to simplify things, I'm just going to put that all into one equation. Um, I'm just wondering whether it's worth, which one's better to try and convert. Um, whether to convert everything into millimeters per second. Um, no, I think I'm going to do it the, the long way around. Um, so I sometimes struggle a little bit with these uh, uh, questions here because you can see it's got a very sneaky, they're giving me this uh, cross section area millimeters squared. Um, so the easiest thing that I find to do with that is just imagine a box that's one meter by one meter. If it's a one meter by one meter box, it is also a thousand millimeters by a thousand millimeters. So what we can say is that one meter squared is equal to 1000 times 1000, which is one times 10 to the six millimeters squared. Um, and that way I can say that one millimeter squared is 1 over 1 times 10 to the 6 uh, meters squared. And therefore, I can rewrite uh, this as 0 0.4 over 1 times 10 to the negative 6 meters squared. Sorry, not 10 times to the negative 6, 10 times into the positive 6, um, just to convert that. So this uh, equation down here, then, I believe, is going to become uh, 900 multiplied by 0 0.4 over 10 to the power of 6. I can take off the one time because it just means the same thing. It just disappears out. Uh, multiplied by... 2.5 squared. Let's bash that into a calculator and hope that I get something approaching the answer in the calculator. Oh, sorry, no, um, I want the total, don't I? So I'm also going to have to multiply that by 400. So I'll just put in here 400 times that. So, um, hard to tell whether this will be big or small. Okay, um, it's going to be about, I'm thinking in the range of about 1 or 1 to 10, I suspect, um, which seems reasonable. Uh, so I've done 400 times 900 times uh, 0 0.4 divided by 10 to the power 6. Okay. And then I want to multiply that by 
2.5 squared hit enter and that comes out as exactly 0 0.9 newtons which would be answer B and look at that the mark scheme agrees with us Question 9. An archer shoots an arrow at a target. The diagram shows the path of the arrow. Air resistance is assumed to be negligible. The graphs show how three different quantities, P, Q and R, relate to the motion of, a, of the arrow, varying with time. What quantity is the horizontal component of displacement? And which quantity is the vertical component of displacement? Okay. Um, so horizontal displacement that's going to be increasing all the time because as it goes off it's going to be uh, getting further and further away um, and with the air resistance being negligible we assume a constant velocity um, so Q must be the horizontal um, so straight away we should see that the answer is B um, but just for completeness sake um, I also know that uh, we're then asking for which one is the vertical. Well, it's going to increase its displacement as it goes up, then decrease it. So yes, also R makes sense for that. Okay, question 10. Um, so here, this is a uh, conservation of momentum question. We've got two balls, mass M and 2M, travelling in a vacuum with initial velocities uh, 2V and V respectively collide as shown. So this is the before situation. Uh, and then it says after the collision, the ball of mass M rebounds to the left with velocity V. Um, and you're asked for the kinetic energy lost in the collision. So um, initially you could be a bit confused because you might be thinking, well, what on earth is happening to the 2M1? You might think, well, does that mean it stays stationary or what? Um, but the, the key to this is to remember that in all collisions, momentum is always conserved. Um, so what I can say is that the total momentum before will be uh, 2V multiplied by M plus 2M multiplied by V, which is 4M, sorry, uh, minus that because they're in opposite directions, aren't they? Uh, so that is uh, 0. So, um, therefore, the momentum after must also be zero. Um, so, this one has momentum mv now. Um, so, I can say this one must have uh, momentum mv as well. So, the only way uh, for that to be the case is if it has the velocity of a half v because then that would be a half v times 2m which gives me m v now i need to work out the total kinetic energy um, so kinetic energy before kinetic energy is a scalar so it doesn't matter about the direction anymore um, so that will be a half times m times 2v squared and i'm going to be adding that to a half times 2m times v squared by itself. Um, so that becomes uh, 4v squared times a half. So that would be 2mv squared plus uh, a half times 2m. That just becomes 1m. Uh, so that would be plus mv squared. So in total, that is 3 mv squared. For this one, um, I'm going to have uh, a half times m times v squared plus a half times 2m times a half v all squared. Um, so that becomes, let's just do this side first, uh, this just the half and the two cancels. That's going to be m times 1 over 4 v squared. I'm going to have a half mv squared plus uh, a quarter mv squared. So that's going to be uh, 3 quarters mv squared. So my delta energy will be 3 take away 3 over 4 lots of 
mv squared. Uh, so uh, that's going to be 12 take away, that's going to be 9 quarters mv squared. I believe, please be the answer in the mark scheme. Yes, it is. Thank you and good night. Question 11. An air bubble is rising through liquid at a constant speed. The force on it are up thrust, viscous drag, and its weight. Uh, which uh, So it's going up, it's rising. Um, so it's going with a constant speed. I expect all of these uh, arrows to be of the same magnitude. Uh, viscous drag will be acting against uh, the direction of velocity. So it's moving upwards. I want uh, V to be pointing downwards. I also want W to be pointing downwards. Up thrust, of course, always points up. So straight away I can get rid of D. That's not right. Um, so it's going to be between these ones. Um, so I'm looking for something where uh, U plus V is approximately... Uh, equal length, so probably a good idea just to uh, get out your um, your ruler and just uh, straight sort of measure it like that. Um, and when you do, what you'd probably find is that A is the one that uh, the, the lengths match up um, and, and work. It's difficult to see on the screen, um, but hopefully with a, with a ruler you'll be able to see that those, those lengths match. Question 12. A rigid circular disk of radius R has its center at X. A number of forces of equal magnitude F act on the edge of the disk. All the forces are in the plane of the disk. Uh, which arrangement of forces provides a moment of magnitude to FR about X? Um, well, I can tell you straight away it's going to be A, isn't it? Uh, because looking at that, well, there's R, whereas there's radius. Um, so this is going to give one moment... Uh, FR, which is acting uh, clockwise. This one is also going to give uh, moment FR, which is also clockwise. Um, so it's going to be A. Um, this one would give a moment of uh, just FR. This one has a total moment of zero, but obviously a resultant force of 2F. Uh, and this one would have uh, 3FR. Oh, that was an easy one. Question 13. Uh, here we have a uniform uh, horizontal beam, OX, uh, which uh, is 4 metres long and weighs 100 newtons. Um, so straight away when I see that, I'm going to think about centre of mass. So I'm going to mark that in there, uh, that I have a 100 Newton uh, force acting from the centre of that. Uh, it's hinged at the wall at point O and supported by a cord XY. So if that's supporting it, I'm also going to note down straight away that there's going to be tension in that cord. Um, and indeed, they're asking what is the tension in that cord. Um, so this is going to be a moments question. Um, and what I can say is that I am interested in a component of force kind of acting, when I say force U for force acting upwards, um, acting here, um, because as we know, um, uh, moments, uh, we take them uh, perpendicular to the, uh, the distance from them. So uh, I want the force acting straight upwards. Okay, um, so easiest thing to do is to take moments about point O. Um, when I do that, I can say that I have a clockwise moment, which is going to be equal to force times distance. So that's going to be my 100 newtons multiplied by, well, the, the centre of mass should be in the middle of this. Um, so that should be 2.0. So I have a clockwise moment of 200 newton meters. Uh, now, uh, it's obviously at rest, so I can say that the anti-clockwise moment uh, is going to be equal to that. So that's also going to be 200 newton meters. Um, and that is equal to that upwards force uh, multiplied by my 4.0 meters. Um, so I can say that my upwards force must have a magnitude of 50 newtons. So now I've got this triangle and what I can say is that it's a triangle that looks something like this. Um, we have a uh, magnitude here 
of 50 newtons um, and I'm asked for this uh, force here which is tension so I'm trying to find that hypotenuse um, and I also know that if I look this way I'm going to have an angle there of 30 degrees so just to make life easier for me I'm going to mark here as this angle is 60 degrees and there are various different ways you could uh, you could then do this um, I think probably the easiest thing to do uh, is to just plug it into the equations so I um, have here uh, 50 degrees which is the uh, adjacent uh, sorry, 50 newtons, which is the adjacent, uh, tension is the hypotenuse, and if you remember, the cosine of an angle is equal to the uh, adjacent over the hypotenuse. So substituting in my numbers, I can say that cos of 60 degrees is equal to 50 over t which is my tension uh, so uh, t is going to be equal to 50 divided by cos of 60 um, now to my shame it's been so long since i've done proper maths um, or taught this side of the course that i can't remember i'm pretty sure it's a half um, but let's just check that uh, Cos of 60, cos, yeah, that is uh, 0 0.5, thought so. Um, so that's going to be 50 divided by a half, which is 100 newtons. So the answer is D. Question 14. A glider is descending at constant speed at an angle of 15 degrees to the horizontal. The diagram shows the directions of lift, air resistance and weight acting on the glider. So constant speed, um, that means that resultant force is going to be equal to zero. Um, so when it's asking for the vector triangle representing all the forces, all these vector triangles are possible because all of them show zero resultant force. So all I need to do is find one where it could match with each of the forces. Now, when I first looked at this, I thought this was a little badly drawn because it looks, at first glance, um, like R is starting all the way from over here and extending out like that, in which case none of these diagrams work. I suspect what CIE have actually done um, is they've drawn this false arrow starting at the tail of the aircraft and going backwards, so it actually only has a size like that. That's a little bit naughty, and I think you guys could actually get in trouble if you did that in your structure. So bear in mind, really, it should start um, at the centre of mass because that's where we take all forces to act from. Um, so yeah, they've been a bit odd with their uh, their conventions there. Um, when we look through these. Um, the only one that makes sense is D. D is obviously the answer because <coughs> if I do that, matching up the uh, the magnitudes, this one must be W, this one must be R, this one must be L. Question 15. The derivation of the pressure equation, pr uh, pressure is, or titanium pressure is rho gh, uses a number of relationships between quantities. Which one is not used? Okay. Now, just looking at this, I'm going to say almost certainly it's got to be B. Um, uh, and that's because there's, there's no form of energy that appears in this equation. We never use it in the derivation. So I'm 99% sure it's going to be B. Let me check the mark scheme. It is. Um, obviously, we need this density equation because, um, well, density appears in there, so I'm going to need density. Um, pressure is force divided by area. Well, if you remember, we do use that um, to, oh, sorry, pressure is force divided by area. Yeah, so there's um, my uh, pressure. I've so the wrong thing for density, didn't I? That's density. Um, and then uh, weight has this uh, acceleration of freefall, which is this G in here as well. So I suppose the, uh, the the sneaky thing they wanted here was this term weight uh, to see if you would remember that, see or try and erroneously put uh, that one in there. Uh, so if you remember this height term, um, that comes from uh, we divide a volume by an area at some point in this derivation when we derive volume by area. We get that. I'm um, just so you remember the full definition. Um, it's something like this. So if I have a column of water or a column of fluid uh, that has a density of uh, mass over volume, has a cross-sectional area 
A. Um, so if I'm interested in the pressure here, that is force over area. That force um, is the weight due to uh, the uh, water. So the weight of the water is rho g volume. Uh, so it's density times volume, which gives us the mass. Mass times g gives us uh, uh, the weight. And then I'm dividing that uh, by cross-sectional area. Um, and if you remember, volume is equal to cross-sectional area multiplied by height. Um, so this becomes rho g a h over a. Cancel the a's and you get rho g h. At no point have we used potential energy in that derivation. Question 16. A metal wire fixed at one end has length L and cross-sectional area A. I suspect this is going to be about... Oh, no, it's not about resistivity. This is about Young's modulus. OK. Uh, the wire extends distance E when mass M is hung from the other end of the wire. OK, so we're looking at a, a situation like this. Always a good idea just to um, sketch this. There's mass M. Uh, length is L. Uh, and cross-section area is A. Okay, uh, the wire extends uh, distance E, so we can mark that as my extension. What's the equation for Young's modulus? Okay, so if you remember, uh, Young's modulus is stress over strain. Uh, stress, that is uh, force per unit area. And strain is uh, extension over original length. Um, so this equation becomes F over A multiplied by L over delta L. Uh, so I just need to say, well, what is this force? Uh, force is mg. Uh, Delta L, I'm using the symbol E for, so I think this equation should collapse to uh, MGL over AE. Uh, is that one of the options? Yeah, that looks like B. Let's just check the mark scheme, and that is the answer. Okay, question 17. Platform suspended by four, <clears throat> excuse me, by four steel wires. Uh, each wire is five meters long, uh, and each has a diameter of 3.0 meters. Now, that diameter of 3.0 meters could cause you problems. So the best thing to say um, is rearrange that to, okay, that gives us a radius of 1.5 times 10 to the negative three meters. So let's go straight away and say our cross-sectional area then will be pi times 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 all squared. Um, we're then given the unconscious of steel. Uh, the wires bay hook law when a load of mass 200 kilos is placed on the platform. Now, there are two different ways you could treat this. Uh, because you've got four wires, what you could do is you could uh, multiply this cross-sectional area by four. So you've got the total cross-sectional area for all the wires. Or you can share the mass between each of them and say that the mass on one wire um, is 50 kilos. Personally, I always do it this way, um, but I suppose it's equally or possibly even more valid to do it uh, by multiplying uh, the cross-sectional area by four. Either way, you'll get the same answer. So we may as well use the same equation that we started with earlier. We know that Young's modulus is MGL over uh, cross-sectional area times extension. Rearrange that extension becomes mass times gravity times length over cross-sectional area times Young's modulus. And because we went through and uh, put in the right numbers, all we have to do now is substitute in our values. So that will be 50 times 9.81 times 5.0 over pi lots of 1.5 times 10 to the negative 3 all squared multiplied by 2.1 times 10 to the positive 11. Do take care putting this into your calculator because I know I made a couple of mistakes when I did this. Um, and that comes out as 4.13 times 10 to the negative 4. And this is an extension, so that's going to be in meters. There's our answer, B. 
Okay, question 18. Strain graph for metal is shown. What is the strain energy per unit volume? Now, um, this is a stress strain graph, so uh, the strain energy per unit volume from a stress strain graph, as you should just know, that is the area under this curve. So I'm interested in this area here. Um, don't forget that uh, you need to do a half because it's a triangle. Uh, so it'll be a half times 0 0.10 multiplied by this stress. This is stress in gigapascals. So I need to take out the giga. So that'll be times 10 to the 9. And when you get that, you get uh, 1.0 times 10 to the power 10, which is the same as a mega, uh, sorry, as 10 megajoules. Question 19. A string has a spring constant, sorry, a spring has a spring constant of 6 newtons per centimetre. Uh, it's joined to another spring as a con spring constant of 4 newtons per centimetre. Load of 80 newtons is suspended from the composite spring. What is the extension? Okay, so what I'm firstly going to do is combine these two springs together. Um, now, what I want to remember is these are springs in parallel. So, I don't know about you, sometimes I find it difficult to remember. Do I want uh, 1 over the total? is equal to 1 over 1 plus 1 over 2 or do I add the spring constants together? So a little trick to, to just working out if you, if you like me, you can't just remember it. Think about what you'd expect the spring constant to do. Um, the higher the spring constant, the more force you need to make it extend by one centimeter. So we can say that this one is stiffer uh, than this one. Uh, the six newtons is stiffer than four newtons because it needs more force to extend. Now, if I've got two springs together, I would expect that I'd need to put in less force in order to make it longer. So, therefore, I know that I'm going to be using this form of the uh, spring constant. 1 over the final spring constant is 1 over the spring constant of the first, plus 1 over the spring constant of the second. So, to get that combined spring constant, I'm going to do 1 over 6 plus 1 over 4, and then take the uh, reciprocal of that. So 1 divided by 6 plus 1 divided by 4, that is uh, 0 0.416. 1 divided by 0 0.416 comes out as 2.40 newtons per centimeter. And that's what I would expect. Um, I'd expect it to be less than both than either of these because uh, it should drop. So now I am going to do uh, force is equal to uh, spring constant multiplied by extension. So extension is equal to uh, force divided by spring constant. My force is 80, so 80 over 2.40. Punch that into a calculator. That is 33.3 uh, recurring, so I can say 33 centimetres. Let's check that was D, yeah. uh, Question 20. The tensile, a, a tensile force of 7.0 mega newtons. Uh, so I'm just going to write here for my future reference 7.00 times 10 to the 6 newtons is applied to a sample of steel. This causes the sample to extend by 5.00 millimetres. So I'm going to say 5.00 times 10 to the negative 3 metres. Um, the sample obeys Hooke's law. What is the work done? Okay, um, so it's obeys Obeying Hooke's law. Um, so uh, again, we're going to imagine uh, the graph is going to be looking something like this. If this is the length, um, so I know that it's the. Uh, Sorry, that's, that's extension. I know it's the area under a false extension curve. Uh, so I would expect it to uh, be this area of this triangle. Um, yeah. So I think I want this combined area. Uh, 
no, sorry, it's a force extension curve, isn't it? So I don't want this combined area. So this would be force length. So a force extension curve would look like that. Um, so I should be doing uh, work done is a half multiplied by 7 times 10 to the 6 multiplied by 5 times 10 to the negative 3. Bash that into a calculator because I don't like mental maths. Uh, times helps if I could use a calculator without pressing the wrong buttons. So exponential 6 multiplied by 5. I mean, I suppose you could probably actually be quicker to do this in your head, but. There we go. Uh, that is 17500, which converting it, that is 17.5 kilojoules, which is C. Question 21. Pleasant time graph for a layer of air in the path of a sound wave is shown. What quantity is increasing? So I can see that the wavelength is decreasing because this is wavelength. I'll call that wavelength 1. I'll call that wavelength 2. So clearly the wavelength is decreasing, the amplitude staying the same. Um, so the wavelength definitely isn't increasing, it's decreasing. Uh, the time period as well, time period is time taken, so that's decreasing. Um, and it's the frequency is increasing. So the wavelength is decreasing, frequency is increasing. So 21 is B. 22, oh, this is uh, showing the compressions and rare fractions of a wavelength. Um, so if you remember, this is a compression. Let's not write that there because that's hard to see. That's a compression. That's a rare fraction. Uh, compression, refraction, compression. So a wavelength is the distance between one compression and the next, or one refraction and the next. Both of these would be wavelengths, but the only one that's labelled is QR. So uh, where's that? QR is, don't, sorry, PR. <laughs> uh, PR isn't, is that one of the options? Uh, what is this equal to one wavelength of the wave? That would be P2, oh, oh, Q2S, sorry, yeah, Q2S is well, that's what I have marked. Uh, question 23. A sound wave is displayed on the screen of a CRO, as shown. A time base is set to 2.5 milliseconds per centimetre. What is the frequency? Okay, so what I'm going to do here is just read off from the top. Um, so we're saying one square is one centimetre, so this is one, two, three, four centimetres. So therefore I can say that the time period is equal to four centimetres times 2.5 uh, milliseconds per centimetre. Uh, so that becomes uh, 10 uh, milliseconds. I'm just going to write that as 10 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds. Frequency is 1 over time period. So that's going to be 1 over 10 times 10 to the negative 3, uh, which is... Uh, 100 hertz. So that's B. Question 24. Diffraction can be observed when a wave passes through an obstruction. The diffraction effect is greatest when the wavelength and the obstruction are similar in size. That's true. Uh, for waves traveling through air, what combination of wave and obstruction could best demonstrate this fact? So microwaves passing around a steel post. Well, microwaves... Um, they have um, uh, a few centimetres um, as their uh, wavelength. Uh, diameter of a steel post, okay, that could be in centimetres. That's looking like a candidate. Uh, radio waves, well, that's in uh, metres to kilometres. Well, diameter of a copper wire, uh, that's got a length of millimetres, so it's definitely not going to be B. Sound waves passing a human hair. Again, sound waves are kind of meters to centimeters, 
while human hairs are in the micrometer range, so it's not going to be C, and visible light around a gatepost. Okay, so it's definitely going to be A as our answer, because visible light, uh, that has a wavelength in the hundreds of nanometers range, uh, while a gatepost has, again, uh, in the centimeter range. So this one's basically saying, do you understand what the, what the rough uh, wavelength of waves are, first of all, and do you know the rough wavelengths of things in the world around you? So that's part of the estimation that you need for your... Uh, uh, practical sections of the course as well. 25 is all about uh, the Doppler effect and I've gone ahead and uh put in the substitute in the equation here from the formula sheet because it's one of the very few times when you actually get given the equation which is nice to see. Um, so FO is the observed frequency, FS is the frequency of the source so let's just mark that, that's FS. Uh, speed of sound is 340 meters per second so that is uh, the velocity and then uh, linear speed so that will be a uh, velocity of the source okay so um, they're asking for the maximum frequency so to do this um, I want this uh, observed frequency to be as large as possible which means I want to uh, divide by the smallest thing possible so I'm going to use the uh, minus form of this so f0 will be the frequency of the source so that would be uh, 846 multiplied by the velocity of sound, which is 340, divided by uh, my 340. And again, what did I say I wanted to do? I want to divide by the smallest thing, so I'm going to take away uh, that. So that becomes uh, 25. So I get uh, 846 multiplied by 340 divided by... 340 take away 25 put into a calculator uh, and that becomes 913 hertz excellent question 26 is all about stationary wave on a string um, it gives us the instant at uh, which is at its maximum so we can see that it has a, a full amplitude of uh, minus 1.0 millimeters um, and we've got the frequency here. So we're asked then for the displacement at a time uh, 5 milliseconds. So to do that, I'm going to say that the time period of the wave is 1 over the frequency, uh, which will be 1 over 250, which comes out as uh, 4 times 10 to the negative 3 seconds, which is 4 milliseconds. So just thinking about the journey of this, um, as it goes up, and then back down, then to the top, and then back down. Um, so I know that to get back to that point will take four milliseconds, which means it must have been at the top at two milliseconds, um, which means it must have got to here at one millisecond. So it takes one millisecond to get to the top, we've got five milliseconds in total, so after five it will be one millisecond, two millisecond, three millisecond, four millisecond, five millisecond takes us back to the zero point, so the answer is going to be B. 27, we've got two signals uh, approaching each other. Uh, at one instant, the signals completely overlap. Ooh, okay, that's interesting. Um, so let's draw them completely overlapping. So I want to draw the two over the top of each other. So I'm going to have, at this point, I've got minus one and then minus one as well. Um, and then I've got uh, minus one and minus one then I've got zero and minus one so it's going to go up like that uh, yeah okay, until we get to the middle um, and now this is at zero so zero plus this one um, it's going to look like that and then down so I think I'm looking for this kind of shape which seems to correspond with A for 27 28. Two identical loudspeakers are connected in series to an AC supply. So I can see if they're connected in series like that, that's going to make them more or less uh, coherent, which I think is why they've mentioned that. Uh, microphone has moved along P to Q. Which, mic which graph best shows a variation in P from the intensity of sound detected? All right. Um, so... 
you should remember you're going to get a graph that looks something like this. We have a central maxima uh, when it's at the middle and then sort of decreasing along as we go. So it's definitely not C or D. So the only, the only thing to think about then is, is it uh, A or B? Now, in theory, you should have complete uh, cancellation of the two waves. Uh, when you get into an area of uh, a minima. So uh, I'm pretty sure I would expect my uh, amplitude to go completely to zero. Um, but obviously, um, in the real world, um, that's not necessarily always what we would uh, receive. You'd still be able to detect some of it, especially as it's not a, a perfect uh, a perfect source so we're going to go with a for that one although if you said b that's not too bad i think the reason that b is not right is that actually this this looks fairly linear it's hard to see but it looks like fairly linear whereas what you'd actually expect is it to fall off as kind of a curve which i think this one's doing a better job of doing this one doesn't look like it's a straight uh, a line curve falling off but yeah a little bit tricky 28 don't worry if you said c or d you might have an issue if you said B, I wouldn't worry too much about that. Uh, yeah. 29. In a dark room, a small source of red light illuminates two slits that are 0.75 millimetres apart. A few metres beyond the slit, light falls on screen, producing a series of equally spaced bright lines. What change would cause the distance between the bright lines to be reduced? Okay, so change the source emitting for blue light. If you do that, you are increasing frequency, so you are decreasing the wavelength. Um, reduce the distance between the light source and the slits. So if you're doing that, you're decreasing D. Um, I can tell you straight away it's not going to be that. Uh, reduce the distance between the slits. So there you are increasing the slit separation. Um, and again, I just happen to know that the smaller your slit separation, the greater your uh, fringe separation is. Um, or reduce the intensity. Well, intensity has nothing to do with this if you think about the equation. So it's definitely not uh, D. So pretty sure it should be C. Uh, the mark scheme tells me I am wrong. Uh, why is that wrong? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, because I'm sorry. It's asking me to reduce the distance between the, uh, the slits. That's a good question to um, read it carefully. Yes. Yeah, so uh, longer wavelengths, sorry, shorter wavelengths, um, they diffract less for any given uh, gap. So yeah, you'd expect uh, blue light to reduce it. Um, you can always write down the equation if you're unsure. Question 30. A diffraction grating is used to measure the wavelength of monochromatic light. That's good. So that means we've got a single wavelength. That makes it a bit easier. Uh, the space between slits and the grating is that. Uh, okay, so good. They've already given us the grating. It's not lines per millimetre, so that's going to make things easier. The angle between the first order and the maxima is 70 degrees. What is the wavelength? Um, so we know that d sine theta is equal to n lambda. Uh, n is 1, so I can just say... Uh, slit separation which is d uh, so that becomes 1 times 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by sine of 70 is equal to lambda uh, again as usual with these make sure you have got the correct mode on your calculator uh, so 1 times 10 to the negative 6 multiplied by sine of 70 my calculator is telling me that is 9.3, let's say 40 uh, times 10 to the negative 7, which is the same as 940 nanometers. 31. A neutron, and as it's given us the uh, nuclear notation for a neutron, is fired at a U235 nucleus. The neutron is absorbed by the nucleus, which then splits to form two new nuclei. This is basically just a conservation of uh, nuclear num nucleon number for this one. So we're going to say uh, 10 neutron plus 23592U splits into. 14158 barium plus uh, 9238 krypton, that's a capital K, sorry, plus an unknown number, uh, I, I probably shouldn't use the word N, uh, let's call it X number of uh, 
sorry, one zero neutrons. So the question is, what's left over? So uh, going in, I have uh, two, three, six going in. Uh, over 92. Coming out, I have 141 plus 92, uh, which is 17. Sorry, uh, plus 92, uh, which is 223. Two, two, three. Um, so I'm just going to make it nice and easy this way. Uh, so therefore, I am missing three neutrons. Now, you might actually just know that because that is the, uh, the general equation for. Uh, nuclear power stations but if you didn't know it you can work it out 32 data contains uh sorry the table contains data for four different nuclei p q r and s uh two which nuclei are isotopes so remember isotopes they have the uh same pr number of protons different number of neutrons uh so i can straight away say it's probably not going to be uh that what well, maybe it will be actually never, never mind let's uh, let's just check uh, the number of protons probe number of protons will be a uh, nuclear number minus number of neutrons so that's five four uh that's worrying that i can't do that in my head uh, nine maybe nine uh I should, full disclosure to you guys, I'm uh, I'm recording this in the UK and I've been teaching at three. what's been three o'clock in the morning for me. Um, so apologies that I'm a little bit slow on this. Uh, and that's also eight. There we go. OK, so it's uh, it's uh, R and S because they've got the same number of protons. If you can do very simple addition subtraction, that's an easy question. OK, 33. What's the quark composition of hydrogen-3 nucleus? Uh, so that is uh, one proton and two neutrons. Uh, OK, so um, I always remember it as uh, up is uh, positive um, and down is sort of negative. Um, so if you remember that, that should remember that an up is plus two thirds while a net down is minus a third. Um, so uh, one proton, so this is a, a proton, a neutron and a neutron. So my proton will be uh, up, up, down and my neutrons will be down, down, up, down, down, up uh, so I have one two three four five uh, downs and uh, one two three four ups so it should be a 34 which equation represents beta plus decay um, well beta plus creates a positron so it's definitely not uh, a or B B. Uh, now the positron comes out because uh, I'm losing positive charge so both of them are protons and neutrons that's good so these bits are correct for both of them um, a positron is a uh, lepton so sorry it's an anti-lepton it's the uh, an anti-electron um, so I'm going to need to form a, a non-antiparticle neutrino so that will be d remember beta minus decay you form an electron which is a normal lepton so you need an anti-lepton which is the anti-neutrino uh, to balance that out as well 35 which of these are both vector quantities uh, displacement and distance, no distance is a scalar, force and momentum, yes those are both vectors. Uh, just for re reference, time is a scalar, torque is, uh, it is a vector, although it's a difficult vector for uh, A level. And then weight, uh, weight has a, a direction, but pressure doesn't actually have a direction because it's equally transmitted in all directions. So uh, 35 is going to be B. Question 36. An object accelerates uniformly from rest to speed v, then moves at constant speed v for a time of 8 seconds before decelerating uniformly to rest. The total time taken is 12 seconds, and the total distance is 60 meters. What is speed v? Um, I don't know about you guys, but I really like diagrams for this, so I'm going to just draw myself a graph. 
And it's going to look something like that. So it starts from rest, it starts here at zero. It accelerates up to speed v. Um, it then uh, moves at a constant speed for eight seconds. So that's going to be, uh, well, from there to there will be eight seconds. Uh, before decelerating uniformly to rest again. Okay, total time taken, this distance here, that is uh, 8.0 seconds. Sorry, no it isn't. Uh, total time is 12 seconds. Uh, and the total distance travelled is 60... Not S is 60 meters. So you're asked, what is the speed V? Okay. Ah, all right. That's, um, that's quite an interesting question. So, um, I guess what we can do is, can we get an algebraic expression for each of these uh, triangles. So let's turn this into A, B, and C. Um, so what I can say is that this total distance travel is the area under this graph. So I can say that my 60 meters total distance, uh, that is equal to uh, eight lots of my final velocity, because that's the uh, base times height here, plus a half lots of V times, I'm going to call this T1 and this T2. So it would be a half lots of VT1 plus a half lots of VT2. Now I'm really glad I did it that way round because here's what I can then do. I can say 60 is equal to 8 lots of V plus a half lots of uh, V multiplied by t1 plus t2. Why does that matter? Well, I can say t1 plus t2, that's these two unknown bits, that must be equal to my total time of 12 seconds take away 8 seconds. So that's going to be equal to 4 seconds worth of time. So I now get uh, 60 is equal to 8v plus a half times 4 times v, so that becomes 8v plus 2v, so that's 10v. So v should be 60 divided by 10, which is 6.0 meters per second. Um, so I guess the, uh, the takeaway from a question like that is sometimes you'll find that the answer, uh, you know, and I'll be honest with you, um, I kind of got that just by luck um, on this instance. Um, sometimes it's better to just uh, leave things as an algebraic expression to start with, um, and then you find that you can uh, surprise yourself and find something uh, quite useful in your answer. Question 37. Which SI unit expressed in base units is not correct? Um, okay, so there's a couple of different ways that you can just uh, remember this. Um, for this one, for force, I remember force is equal to mass times acceleration. So that will be uh, mass is kilograms multiplied by meters per second squared. So A is correct, so it's not A. Uh, momentum, well, that's uh, momentum P is mass times velocity, so that's kilogram meters per second, so B is correct. C, unit of pressure. Well, uh, pressure is force divided by unit area. We've already worked out force up here. It's kilogram meters per second squared, so that's kg ms to the minus 2. And I'm dividing that by something that is in meters squared. So that should be uh, the meters cancel with the squared. So I should get kilograms per meter per second squared. So I think it's C. Let's just prove that to be complete. 
work done, um, you can remember work is force multiplied by distance, assuming obviously the force is constant. Um, so that becomes kilogram meters per second squared multiplied by meters. So that becomes kilogram meters squared per second squared. So D is also correct. So we could again rule out D and indeed we can see our answer C. Question 38. In still air, a bird, can, a bird can fly at a speed of 10 meters per second. The wind is blowing to the east. So let's just draw this as a vector diagram. So it's going east is that way at 8.0 meters per second. In which direction must the bird fly in order to travel to the destination that is due north of the bird's current location? So, um, what we're going to need to do is we're going to make the bird have to fly in a direction like that, which will be at its 10 meters per second uh, distance in order to get a resultant that's heading up that way. Um, so easiest way of doing this, what should we do? Let's just top and tail these vectors to find uh, that. Um, so this will be... 10 um, and this will be our let's, let's start with this angle theta here i'll find that first um, so i've got a distance here of eight this sorry eight across the bottom 10 across the top uh, so i can say uh, cos of theta is equal to uh, adjacent over hypotenuse so that's 8.0 over 10 so uh, i just do cos of 0.8 sorry um cos theta is that sorry so i do inverse cos of 0 0.8 so i can say cos theta is uh, 0 0.8 so theta is cos to the minus one of 0 0.8 uh which is uh 36 point uh, nine degrees um, they're asking for the direction from north so uh, the actual one that I'm interested in, I mean I probably could have done this a little bit more sensibly um, but this angle will be uh, 90 degrees take away 36.9 uh, which is 53 degrees uh, so that should be C Question 39. Uh, at temperatures close to zero Kelvin, the specific heat capacity C of a particular solid is given by C is B times T, where T is a temperature and B is a constant characteristic of the solid. So we've got the SI unit of uh, specific heat capacity, then they're asked for the constant B in base units. All right. So what I just do is I'm just going to set out the uh, equation. So I've got C is BT. So the units for C is joules. And I'm going to write it out uh, in the long form or the sort of showing the division just to make it easy. Joules over kilograms per C. And that is equal to whatever the uh, units of B are multiplied by Kelvin. Um, so to get the thing that we want by itself, I'm just going to divide both sides by Kelvin. So that's joules over kilogram per Kelvin squared, um, which is joules per kilogram <coughs> per square Kelvin. Uh, oh, sorry, this is in joules. Um, so now I can get rid of the joules. I know that, um, again, F is MA. So that is kilogram meters per second uh, to minus one um, so replace the joules so that becomes kilogram meters per second multiplied by kilograms to the minus one multiplied by uh, kelvin to the minus two the kilogram to the minus one and the kilogram cancelled so i get meters per second per kelvin squared uh, which isn't an option. So what have I done wrong? Oh, sorry. This is an acceleration, isn't it? So that's second squared. Again, two o'clock in the morning, guys. Give me a break. Uh, so it's uh, going to be 
this one here. Well, no, not that one there either. Huh. Question 39. Uh, this is about um, homogeneity of units. So we've got uh, the particular capacity of a particular solid is given by C is B, T, R. I think I didn't actually see this. I've written over it, so let's just delete that. Oh, uh, C is B, T cubed. Right. So, um, they're asking for what are the uh, units of B. So, I, I can say that something which is measured in joules per kilogram per kelvin is equal to some constant B multiplied by something that is in uh, kilograms, sorry, kelvin uh, cubed. So, uh, what I'm going to do is uh, divide both sides by Kelvin cube to get B by itself. So the units of B should be joules per kilogram per, stop doing a lowercase k, per Kelvin to the negative 4, because I'm dividing by uh, to the 3, so it becomes negative 1, negative 4. Um, and now I just want to get rid of this joules, so I know that the units of joules are kilogram meters per second squared. So I'm going to replace this joules with kilogram meters per second squared, so that becomes kilogram meters per second squared Kelvin to the minus 4. The kilograms... Uh, Oh, sorry, I forgot my uh, kilograms there. Kg, capital K again. Don't know why I keep going mental block with a lowercase k. Kilograms both cancel. So I get uh, meters per second squared per Kelvin to the power negative four. Last but not least, question 40. A mass in a spring bounces up and down as shown after being released at time t is zero. What graph shows how velocity varies with time? So the easy way to remember this is that velocity is the gradient of a distance time graph. So at uh, time t is zero, let's just try and we can draw this over the top, couldn't we? So at time t is zero, if I do this here as a velocity graph, uh, the gradient is zero, so I'd expect it to be here. So straight away I've got rid of B. Uh, yeah, just got rid of B. Um, then at this tick mark I have a uh, positive gradient going up, so I'm looking for something that is positive. So uh, that matches with that, so uh, I'm looking for something that does this. Uh, so A is still in, C is now out, um, and then when I get to this second tech check mark, my gradient is now zero, um, which means that my velocity is zero. So I'd expect it to look like that. There we go. Without doing any more, I can say that. Uh... Oh no, sorry. Okay, so still still A or C. Yeah, so they're still both potentially initial potentially working. Um, but then when I get to this third check mark, now I have a negative gradient, so my velocity is down there, so I'd expect it to look like this. So now I can say D is wrong, uh, A is definitely my answer.